Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. Once again, zeroing in on another school. We had Michigan on Tuesday. Today, we're talking the Texas A&M fighting Aggies. Big expectations. The highest rated recruiting class in the history of recruiting classes. And to talk about the Aggies, we bring in a very special guest, Billy Lucci, the founder of TexAgs.com, one-time enemy of Ari Wasserman. And now they actually get to meet for the first time. You've been trying to bring us together for a while, so I think we've already planned our, our first uh, Dallas lunch date, so we'll have that going. But yeah, I, I, it, like we said, Andy is the one that brings all sworn or not sworn enemies together. We squash one, the Twitter beefs here. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have this personal problem where I used to have Twitter beefs with a lot of people, and I've become Same. much more mellow on Twitter and have really resisted the urge to to snap at people um and i've just been happier in life and you know i went down memory lane because it's been billy it's been like almost two years now right or a year and a half yeah. since that happened yeah. and uh you know i was in cabo on vacation that night and that's no way to be spending vacation so this i'm excited to relitigate it championship game alabama's playing ohio state Ari's in Cabo in one of those villas with a with your own private plunge pool. With that's where I was, his... Billy. That whole time I was like God. in a pool. <laughs> I, you know, and here's the thing: at least SEC realignment, you know, SEC expansion didn't break out when you were in Cabo because that's what happened to me. Same situation, except I, I actually instead of just firing off a you know like back and forth barbs on Twitter, I had to do that. But I've been in the car before, and we like pulled over to go to dinner and I was, I was actually on, you know, whatever you want to call it a date. And I'm, I'm like, hang on, I got to reply. Let's call it a date, Billy. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I got to reply to this person. <laughs> it wasn't you, but it was just like a Twitter thing. And the girl was like, wait, that's, that's, you're like fighting with someone on Twitter. And I go, well, yeah, you don't. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Let's go to dinner. So. It's so funny too, because Britt can totally tell, like I get, I get locked in and I, and like, I have this habit of, of, not being able to hear anything around me if I'm locked in on the phone. If somebody's talking to me or something's happening, like I'm so, so deep into it that I'm like in a trance yeah. and it very much frustrates her. So, you know, I will fight with anybody that has a lot of followers and has a big following. What I've done now is I'm not fighting with people that have eggs anymore or people that are just trying to get under my skin because I, I think I was just, you know, hitting that too easily. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, Billy, I, I have been called a Texas A&M homer for much of the past year. I've which noticed is a, that. Which is a, is a pretty interesting turn of events when it comes to uh, the way things have been going. And I, I want to show you this. Um, and I don't know if you know this about me, but my wife is an Aggie. I, I actually did know that at somehow along the way on Twitter. But yeah. Um, so so you're in. I have no hate at all for Texas A&M. I just have this, this inability to not just be cut and dry about things. And if I feel something and you know what, I'm right, I'm wrong, whatever, I'm a human. Uh, but I just try my best to be as straightforward as possible. And at that time, I didn't believe that Texas A&M should have been in the playoff. And now I think they're one of the best uh, uh, programs in America. So, you know, things change fast, everything's cyclical and I'm happy we can relitigate some of this stuff. You want to take a look at these? Because it feels like you don't remember any of them. I feel oh, like this is great. I'm looking at Johnny's right now. That's a little wordy for him. I'm 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 impressed he, that he already made Johnny very mad. Like yeah, like, that was like a long <laughs> for him. This is like, an essay question for Johnny. For him, that's but, like hey, he's so ADD. That's like asking, yeah, it's like asking him to write a, a college entrance essay right there. That's a lot of words. So uh, so Johnny got mad at something Ari wrote. This is Ari on December 12th. 2020 wrote Notre Dame beats Clemson again. Who is your number four team? A and M who got shit pumped against Alabama and has no elite win or undefeated PAC 12 champ USC question mark makes you think this is when Ari was on his USC kick, which that's right. drove that, me that's insane. the thing that was so upsetting to me about that was this wasn't even, and I, I get it. I wrote it so elegantly. I said the word shit pumped and that, that was I, probably I think what got me going. Yeah, it's probably like hell yeah. He's gonna say things like shit pump. It's yeah, good. yeah, and, and but I, that, I that's what got Johnny going. So jo Johnny, but this writes... wasn't even an A and M conversation, Andy. This was me <laughs> jabbing you about why we were writing off USC in the middle of November as an undefeated team. Yeah, um, I'm not saying they were better than A and M or that they were the best team in America or should have been in the playoff. My only stance from that tweet 
was why are we writing off undefeated teams? And then Johnny thank, retweeted thank that, you. and it became an AM discussion when it never was supposed to be in the first place. And, and thank goodness he did because he brought you two together ultimately. Because so Johnny, Johnny retweets you and says, for a person that writes about college football, you obviously don't know shit. Notre Dame beats Clemson. <laughs> A&M is in along with Ohio State. You can't trash an A&M team that's beaten Florida and lost one game to the best team in America. No less. And so let us fast forward exactly one month to January 12th, 2021. And I'm watching the national championship game and the commentaries in Spanish. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, so that was the title game between who? Bama and Ohio State. Bama and Ohio That's State. Right. So Ari's in yeah. Cabo. Billy, I don't know. You, you may be at home. You could have been in Cabo. You and Ari live very similar lives. So I wouldn't be shocked if you were in Cabo at the same time. That would have um, been awesome. So <laughs> Billy takes the this. Location. Billy takes this tweet that, that it emanated from this same argument where Ari goes, the impressive win propping up AM got vastly less impressive when that team lost to a 23 point dog at home, referring to Florida's loss mm. to LSU in the shoe throw game. Uh, context changes as results come in. Number two, AM didn't just lose to Bama. They got embarrassed by the caliber of team playoff teams were supposed to be able to compete with. This is what Ari had replied to Johnny with in December. Okay. And Billy, you put in receipts because you were you you guys were having this argument as Ohio Ohio State is losing to Alabama the same way in, AM did. And yeah. here's the beauty of all this, and this is why it's so Twitter, right? Like as yeah. we revisit it, basically you had a bunch of people, and not just us, but the whole country, arguing between Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, I mean Ohio State, Clemson, Notre Dame, and AM, right? Yep. Four teams for three spots, all of whom either did or would have gotten their ass kicked by Alabama. <laughs> exactly. The greatest, you know, that was my the greatest thing. team in the history of college football. Yeah. It's, it's it was driving me insane debate. the whole time. Like, why are you guys arguing so much that this Notre Dame and AM are the same thing? AM might have been the big winner in the deal by not going. Now, it, you could, like, I, I've said in the last month, guys. I felt much more strongly that you you could not convince me in in a hundred years that A and M didn't deserve to be in the NCAA tournament this year. I thought that was such a bigger snub than because you we could have sat down and, and it would be a round and round where I don't think anybody would would give in to say whether you wanted to say Ohio State, Notre Dame, or A and M in that in that playoff. You could do the whole. A&M got destroyed in their biggest test. Florida ended up, you know, they lost to a bad LSU team. I don't really talk about that Cotton Bowl with half their team, but they lost to a bad LSU yeah. team that finished 500. Ohio State only played X number of games, barely won a couple of them. And then you could go to, you know, the Notre Dame thing of the whole, you know, Longhorn fans like to call A&M's year COVID season. And I'm sitting here going, you hold the fact that Jimbo hadn't won 10 games yet against him. The only reason they didn't is because they didn't play Ole Miss at Kyle Field that year. Uh, the second part of that is, in some weird bit of irony, COVID might be, have been exactly what kept AM from reaching the playoffs, which was Trevor Lawrence getting COVID before they were losing. Notre Dame. Right, them losing to Notre Dame the regular season. That, I, but, I, it's, I hadn't thought about that, but you're, you're right about that. But it, it, this this – blossomed into a beautiful Twitter beef because Ari Ari goes, the only way this night could get better is being retweeted by a Texas A&M fan site publisher. And the disdain, I can see the disdain as he types that. Yeah. Well, because the thing that I, I want to say, and this isn't a Billy thing, this is something that happens or has happened to me regularly in the past is that I'm trying to enjoy my evening. I'm watching a sporting event. And then you're, somebody you're, who has a massive following a massive following of a bunch of fans who think one way retweeting a thought from two months ago. That isn't even what I meant. And then like I get avalanched with a bunch of, of, of people calling me a moron, which is fine. It used to like uh, Tennessee hit me way harder than Texas A&M. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee hits everybody. Hard. Um, but it OU, wasn't even, Tennessee. I didn't yeah. even, I wasn't even thinking about the A&M debate that night. So like when that started, it was never even my intention. And the entire idea of of that year was so messed up anyway, guys. Like, I yeah. mean, oh, yeah. you had a team that played half a schedule and you had, um, you know, another team that didn't play that great of a schedule. And then you had a team that had to, the unfortunate 
uh, luck of having to play that Alabama team in the regular season. So it's like how to like parse through all that, I guess, is it's kind of an impossible thing to do. But yeah, and I've been on both ends of that where you get dogpiled yeah. and and maybe or maybe not. I knew when I did that, and it's <laughs> and I get what you said about the the fans. You knew what you were doing. Come on, you know what you were doing. You were sicking the and, dogs on me. And but I didn't know you were in Cabo, Ari. Yeah, if you would have known I was that, in Cabo I with the Corona, I got my lovely bride next to me. I, I would have had an appreciation for what you were doing. And I said, I don't even know him. I didn't even know that he was good friends with Staples. But I, <laughs> I that is that is that sacred ground. You don't do that. Yeah, so no, it, it, it's just that. like too. It's just so it, funny because it's, it, it's just it, not it, even what my intention yeah. was. And like a lot of the tweets that were referenced in that entire debate didn't even have anything to do with a and It was me and Andy arguing about whether or not USC should even be in the college football playoff discussion. That maybe was the Elon, whole thing. Maybe they Elon Musk will fix it. Twitter's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he will. He's <laughs> got all those shares of Twitter now. Um, <laughs> He's not allowed to be a I, board yeah, member. Thank God Oregon beat USC though. that year to, to eliminate that little portion of the debate. So you, right. you didn't have to make my head explode, Ari. That's I'm, I'm glad for that. But it, it is interesting because you got me thinking because for the last – year and change when when billy's name has come up in conversation are you the the fear in your voice has been evident I'm and i'm, I'm and, scared <laughs> but it, it's funny how people and he knows that's not true people come off on twitter versus how they are in real life like i'm now i am just as much of a jerk in real life as i am on twitter like i can be nice on twitter yeah and i can be nice in real life but i also have my moments in real life and especially on twitter where i am a complete jackass and it, that's that's fine but like billy is awesome all the time in person he seems and like a totally Twitter, chill dude yeah. he can seem very <laughs> very mean you know why it is i'm gonna tell you why it is is twitter it's like it's just like you said all right I, I get it every single day every like you said everything and you guys are national so y'all get this because just like you said about a and you've been saying really good things about a m for for the better part of the last year so i think aggie fans need to remember that if you know if the worm turns and and there are reasons to be criticized and you're out there and go he doesn't hate a m just like andy andy's built up a ton of goodwill with a m people so whenever anybody says well staples said this and it was negative about it you you have to go back and i, I always think remember that that the national media person's history do they have a history where they're all they've done is trash your school as a fan, Tennessee, OU, a and whatever, then fine. But if you're conveniently ignoring that they've actually been really even handed and you're just mad in the moment, then I'm always the one to say, Hey guys, they're not an enemy of A&M. They're just telling you what they think. Well, and, but, and I, A&M it's, it, it's easier for me because the, my introduction to A&M was during realignment. Yeah, I, I had just gotten, you know, I got the job at SI in 2008. So I'm still kind of learning all the different parts of the country that I hadn't dealt with before. And so a lot of those first major stories that I had to write about AM were about them being courted by the SEC the year they didn't go. And then mm -hmm. the year they did. I just remember being, where was I? I want to say I was at an Oklahoma, maybe like an OU Texas game. Mm -hmm. And this is when the move is being made. I don't think you guys were in the SEC yet, but somebody from, from OU or somebody from Texas, either one, I think it was somebody from OU goes, boy, the SEC fans don't know what they're getting. I'm like, no, um, y'all don't understand. Like A&M fans remind me an awful lot of Auburn fans and an awful lot of yeah. Tennessee fans. Like they're going to fit right in. It's been a great fit. It really has. If you go through the last 10 years, it's – I'll be honest, and, and this is not a shot at the Big 12. It really isn't. Like, I, I just – it's just reality. And tex, Texas and OU fans are going to realize this too. And, and, Andy, you and I talked a lot about this before A&M went in. I covered the Big 12. I, I know. And I covered the Big 12 when it was up. Right. I it and was, it was had a good year this year. Better than the SEC. Yeah. Like Oak State and Baylor, what they did. But, I mean, I covered the Big 12 when it was the black shirts. And when Colorado – right at the tail end when Colorado was still pretty good. And Texas, you know, throughout that Mac Brown run. And OU, they stunk at the beginning. Then they were elite. Um, Kansas State with Michael Bishop mm -hmm. where A&M, it took a miracle. 
by yeah. him to keep them out of the national title game. So I was, it wasn't like, well, yeah, the SEC is better. During those years, the Big 12 was a lot like what the SEC is now, but what it didn't have, with a couple of exceptions, so every fan base doesn't need to get mad at this, but it didn't have the passion. It didn't have the blood rivalries. It didn't have the 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 national appeal, and it just didn't have the the I'd say the combination of passion and and hate, and just the game day experience. And, and it doesn't compare. Whether it's a home game and the teams could come in, whether it's the road venues, it, there's no comparison and Andy you know and you guys have been there and you sit on the sidelines so you really get a feel for the the atmosphere and the intensity not to mention the level of football now there's no comparison it is a night and day difference in Texas fans and OU fans are about to go why didn't we do this 10 years ago yeah I because that's what I like I get the people saying oh how Oklahoma is not going to be able to just no they will adjust they'll they'll be fine and I think Texas will adjust fine too I think Texas will get better because of better competition and yeah. and having to play against Alabama LSU and and what A&M is now and it's it's going to be fun to watch them get used to it because those are it's OU fans don't like to be lumped in with Texas fans in this way but they are they are more wine and cheese they're closer to texas than they are to say tennessee or lsu fans and they'll uh, see that when they when they start playing you know, these teams every year what's interesting to me and, and billy you can correct me on this if i'm wrong because i'm very new to texas i've only been here for a year and a half two years but the geographical distance between austin and houston is just a car ride yeah but i think that being and having been to both cities many times that the cultural difference between Houston and the, and the college station, which are, those two places are very different too, but mm. it's just a different type of city. It's and, and I feel like Houston fits in with the SEC more than Austin will, or even yeah. Norman to a certain extent. And I'm very curious to see once that expansion does happen in the next few years, how those fan bases adjust to the football crazy sec like attitude because even though texas fans are very passionate here i will say that my limited exposure to a lot of my fiance's friends who also went to AM is that there is a level of obsession with those people that even texas people who are, are, are certainly passionate about their team uh, but it's a level of obsession that they can't match and i feel like that obsession is kind of what makes sec football what it is yeah. and i'm very curious to see how those things all mesh together it's really interesting you you cuz i mean you hear in basketball is a different animal in the south i feel like every new basketball coach at these places that you know whether it's buzz williams at a&m or chris beard or if you know beard at tech or texas or wherever these guys go oklahoma lsu anywhere in the south you have to win before the fans come but you know the the there, the, and Austin's Austin's great, and, and it's one of the, I think it's one of the best cities in America. But it just at times it doesn't feel like like Texas or like you just said SEC. There's so much to do, and and I think that factors in a little bit into the you know the they'll kind of come and go. They'll kind of come and go. And, and the, it, the, my, my I, Texas and USC know. are the same job theory. Although I, I, I now I think Texas that. and Florida are the same job. But is it crazy to reasons. think that Texas and Oklahoma, like if we were creating fake super conferences, mm. I feel like Texas would be a better fit in the Pac-12 as like a West Coast power, even though it's not on the West Coast. Geography doesn't matter anymore. I think they that's would why that almost SEC. happened. Yeah. And like it would have been a really, really cool thing to see Oklahoma and Texas go to the Pac-12 with USC and Oregon and then create that subdivision of football on the West Coast. The SEC was already great. You don't need to tamper with it. Maybe add a few teams to the Big Ten that, that are kind of in no man's land. And if you had three super conferences, maybe put a team like Clemson in the Big Ten with, with those teams, and you'd have a hell of a, of a new landscape. The SEC, but yeah, you, yeah, no, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying it's the most northern area. You if, know, you did what you're talking, if you did what you're talking about, and if, if that would have happened with the Pac-12, 16 and I don't the numbers aren't going to add up here but like you know maybe you keep you know you can do four and it's the ACC and the SEC but yeah like if if 
Kansas and, and their basketball and they go to the Big Ten and, and in Iowa State or, you know, and see to me, I still would say even Missouri, but that that's neither here nor there. But yeah, well, they, get, they wanted get, to go to the Big Ten. They yeah, just let didn't Missouri have go to the yeah. Big Ten, give the SEC, a, like you said, a Clemson or a Florida State, even though I know they're they're kind of blocked out there. But in Texas in the in the Pac-12, yeah, it would it would have been interesting. I think it would have been good for football. But, I, you know, Texas put that thing together and they kind of said, hey, A&M, you ready to go on this ride? We just put it all together. Here it is. You were going to be in A&M said, no, I think we're a better fit and we might be a better fit in the SEC. And, they, and, and the A&M brass was correct. And I still think maybe Texas should have figured out how to make it work to go over there rather than come to the SEC. We'll see. I think OU, Andy, has got the biggest wake-up call coming, meaning their fans. I, I agree with you. They'll be fine. Just I'm, like not worried about, I'm not worried about their football because they've always figured out how to be good in whatever league they've been in. Yes. But, but what I think is just looking at how they've recruited, looking at the teams they've fielded recently – Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what they say, they're, they're going through a coaching transition that has to have some effect in the in the short term, I believe. And I don't think it's going to be all positive, but they're going from. I mean, they, they haven't got out of the Big 12 without losing multiple games the last couple of years. It's been a while since OU's gone and lost four games in a year or five or, or gone several years without being a playoff contender. And I think that could happen to them their first few years in the SEC. And I'm not saying 10 years, but maybe right. it's their three or four years there and they, they're losing, they're going eight and four, nine and four, nine and three Here, years. Here's apart. where I think the coaching change, because you're right. Losing Lincoln Riley hurts. Losing mm -hmm. that offense hurts. Losing, he's a quarterback magnet. He's going to get you yeah. the best quarterback available every single time. So losing that obviously hurts. What Brent Venables brings, though, I think, is an understanding of what the roster has to look like. Yeah. Like Brent and Venables has had the D-line you need to have. If you look at what Oklahoma and Texas have put together in terms of recruiting classes um, the last few years, and you kind of bunch it all together, and you take what A&M did last year in Alabama and Georgia, they're not even in the same stratosphere. Mm -hmm. And I'm right. very curious to see, because you bring those classes in and you says times this by four. AM does this four more times. Texas does their last class four more times. And Oklahoma does their Texas and Oklahoma might be the fifth and sixth or seventh and eighth best teams in the SEC from a pure talent standpoint. And then you're, you're matching in the, the new, um, you know, when, whenever a, a program leaves, they have to adjust to recruiting to a certain extent, just like in the culture of that. And I know that Texas and AM go after a lot of the same players in, in the Lone Star State, but there is a different speed to SEC recruiting, even for the middle tier players. So yeah. I think that Texas and Oklahoma have to get their acts together and sign at least a, a class that borders on a super class in the next few years. So they don't go into that conference and just get their doors blown off right well, off. And, he, day and one. here's a good, here's a good example of this. So uh, Levius Overton who just yeah. signed with A&M, he was originally a class of 2023 reclassified to 2022. His dad played for Oklahoma. But his parents are both athletic administrators. I think dad's the AD at, at Kennesaw State in Georgia right now. Mm -hmm. He just signed with AM. Part of this historically good D-line haul that, that AM has in this class. To be their and eighth D lineman in the class, mind it's, you. It's the eighth top 100 D lineman, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I think seven, seven of the eight, yeah. Yeah. And the Look, thing that I, I might be pulling this out of my ass. So if I'm wrong, just, just tell me because I don't have everything memorized. to the end of his ass? When? Never. <laughs> Go ahead. When's the last time Texas went into freaking Atlanta or wherever that kid's from in the, the heart of Georgia? Yeah, I mean, and got a five star prospect his like that. His dad's in the business. I don't well, think that. I know, but it's not like this is the only A and M kid worked that at Alabama they, together. By the way, well, all right, here you bring up something real interesting here. So his dad did work at A and M for a long time. I knew Milton back in the day. They also beat out OU for Gabe Brownlow Dindy. Uh, in fairness, that's not got, even the only, that's not the only example guys. There's five yeah. examples in the, they, they got, they got, uh, a Stewart. kid out of Scottsdale. They got Jake Who's Johnson out of Georgia. Yeah. Let's I mean, I, actually, I, I want to talk about that, Billy, because one of my big questions with this class is who's going to play right away. 
And yeah. it sounds like the, the dude from Chaparral in Scottsdale is – I heard Jimbo mention him the other day in a press conference. It sounds like mm -hmm. he's ready to go, like, now. Well, he he's really smart, and he's over 6'5 and, and right around 300 pounds now already, and he, he should be in getting ready for his prom. And I, I just from talking to Jimbo and some of the guys during the offseason, say athletically he's as gifted as, as they've seen. Uh, so that's a great combination, and he's here early. None of the other – Brownlow Dindy is. He suffered a torn ACL, unfortunately, at the end of that All-Star game. So he could be back. They're, you know, they're hopefully he'll be back in time for camp. A Anthony Lucas is the name of the, the – Anthony Lucas is yeah. – he, he's an absolute stud, but he also – He's like six foot five, 300 pounds, isn't he, or 285 yeah. pounds? Yeah, and here's what no one else – no one's talking about, though. We're all focused on this year's class. They return – among others, but they essentially redshirted two five stars last year on the D line and Shamar Turner and Tumisha Adelier, who have been outstanding this spring, and McKinley Jackson, who's missing spring while he recovers from uh, shoulder surgery, was a borderline five star that's played a lot that picked AM over Alabama on signing day. So they're going to be able to filter those five star freshmen in as they're ready individually. So it's going to kind of be one maybe in fall camp and then maybe another late in fall camp and then maybe one after three or four games. So the D-line will be fascinating to watch. Um, you mentioned Jake Johnson. I, I think he's got a great shot to start day one at tight end. Well, that's what, when, when Baylor, I saw Baylor Cup was transferring, and obviously he's had a, a snake bit career with a bunch yeah. of injuries. But I, you would think a, a tight end of that athletic caliber transferring suggests that a&M is moving a different direction in that position. Jake's really good. Evan Stewart will uh, be shocked. If, if he doesn't start day one, it's just because he's not, you know, you go with that seniority to start games. But, I mean, he's going to be, I think, from the, from the first time they take the field, he'll be their, you know, one of their two best receivers along well, with Nia Smith. That's, that's been my – that's my question is, is who stretches the field for them because – Obviously, with Anaya Smith and, and Devon A. Chain, you have two pretty versatile weapons that can be in the backfield or that can be uh, that can go out for passes. But yeah. it hasn't felt like they've had that guy who could who could really stretch the field. They had the, who who's the receiver that kept getting hurt? He had the, he had the break. Yeah, had the breakout game who again had, this spring. Yeah, that's that's the thing. They they've got to have a little more consistency mm -hmm. on those you know those big guys in the out. They need another. I mean, there's no other Mike Evans, but that type of, of player to complete the set and help the quarterback. Give him his Kelvin Benjamin here. Yeah. And, and obviously, Evan Stewart, Ari, you're probably very familiar with him mm -hmm. being up there. He's not like the Mike Evans, Kelvin Benjamin. He's more like the recent Texas kids that AM hasn't been able to get. Uh, Jalen Waddell, Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. Uh, those guys that are true home run threats can can go have one of those days that just drops your jaw, like Mike Evans did, but in a different way. But yeah, I think Evan can be that guy. Chris Marshall was the other one who just blew up as a senior, just his second year of football. But he's not here early, and he's he was a lot more raw. It might take him, you know, maybe at least a little into the season. But they did what they needed, and of all the things everybody talks about in this class. The two positions where I think they upgraded most, where they absolutely had to, was wide receiver and, and in the secondary because they've been getting better and better in the secondary, but they haven't just loaded up with a truly elite class, and I think they did this time around. And by the way, they returned two starters at corner. You're going to have a very hard time keeping Denver Harris out of the starting lineup as a true freshman. He's he's that good. He's every bit as good as advertised so far this spring. When it comes to Texas A&M, um, when that really started to be like, oh, wow, was at the end of the 2021 class, if you guys remember how Jimbo finished the 2021 class. Yeah. Um, you know, they really attacked the Cypress area. Um, you know, and some of the names that you just mentioned, I mean, they just got – I think they got like four or five top 100 players to close that class out in like the final yeah. two weeks. And then – I don't know what the turning point was for you, Billy, but when they got um, Evan in the 2023 or 2022 class, I was like, okay, Evan Stewart, the former Texas commit. I was like, wow, this team is really, really humming. And then they got Denver Harris later. Yeah. And it was just like, 
like what was the turning point of just like well we're building something we're excited about what we're doing to like oh my god this team is recruiting like Alabama right now those two were big because they were guys that most even the most tuned in A&M fans would have never thought A&M could get and there were times just covering it and knowing what I know that I was like well they're not going to get those two so but that was momentum and so you bring up those dates and, and I really think you're on to something with the end of that cycle because it was Bryce Foster it was to Miche, it was LJ Johnson. Yeah. He wasn't as big a name, but Remington Strickland was a big head to head with OU. That finish in Houston set the stage for the start in Houston. Houston was where this class was, the nucleus was, and they got off to a great start. They signed like 12 from Houston alone that would have ranked in a, like a number 13 or 14 class nationally as a 12 player. Just from Houston. Here. Yeah. So that, that ending led to that beginning. But I'll tell you what, a, a date that I would I would circle was uh, obviously the Bama game, but but you're talking about a recruiting date. And I think it was a couple weeks later when they played Auburn. That was when Evan Stewart and Walter Nolan were there together, right? They were there, and, and but and it was – Evan came right back after the Bama game. And, and I'm pretty sure Shamar Stewart might have been there too. But Walter Nolan – and Chris Marshall, who ended up being a five-star. So essentially, you had the number one at the time, number one or two player in the entire country from Tennessee, and another soon-to-be five-star go out to midfield before the game, and they commit to Jimbo Fisher. Uh, I thought that was a huge turning point. Not only then you had some like Evan and some other monster names that ended up coming to A&M that were all there that day, Auburn ended up tanking after the Bo Nix injury and all that. But on that day, it was number 11 versus number 15. A&M was a couple weeks removed from beating Bama. It was a sellout, defensive struggle. A&M pulled away and, and really had, by the end of that game had kicked their ass pretty good. That, to me, that day was, was what took it from – like I talked to some of the guys on that recruiting staff after that, and, and they had told me throughout that cycle – this is why the NIL stuff gets so funny. But these guys, when they entered that process after the Orange Bowl, they said, we're going to sign the number one class in the country. Watch. And after that day, I think it kind of – I think it was more like, we might not get to number one. We're going to have a top three or four class for sure. And then I think after that day, it started up again like, we might be able to sign the number one class here. Can I ask one more question? Because I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, I know we're doing a lot of nuts and bolts roster stuff right now. Yeah. Um, Who's the quarterback going to be? That, that was my question. That's because, like, because I went down and I wrote a story about Connor the Wegman. Leap. They don't make the leap unless they have a special quarterback. Connor, but, I went down and I wrote a story. I spent a day with Connor Wegman at his gym, and I left thinking like this kid is a stud. And like, I don't know if I'm a little weird, but I'm kind of like let these kids play mentality. Mm -hmm. um, does he have a shot? I'm just curious. I, like, what, what's going on down there? He has a shot, and I didn't know if I, – I, I think Wigman – I've been here – see, what's funny is is one of the guys that covers recruiting for me, Ryan Broninger, he does a great job, and he he coaches a youth baseball league. You know, how it wasn't like this when when we were kids where you – they play year-round, and there's there are these youth leagues where guys come – we used to call it all-stars, and it happened at the end of your season. Now it's all year, and uh, the guy that, that covers recruiting for me – has known and or coached Connor in, in whatever capacity since he was like 12 years old. Like, so he's known who, so as soon as he won the starting job there at bridge and he kept telling me, watch this kid. He's just, he's just the it athlete. It doesn't matter the sport. It doesn't. And then he started blossoming and, and really most people thought he was going to go to OU. And then that A&M offer came, they offered him in club Nick on back to back days. And, his response was just a lot more gung ho, and, and and immediately, I think the first time he and Jimbo talked, uh, Jimbo felt like that's my guy, that's my guy, that's the guy. I want even to the point where guys and, and you know Quinn Ewers made not one but two passes at A and M there, one before he went to Ohio State the first time, and uh, there was serious consideration put in. And won the second time after the transfer. 
Um, neither time, I, I think both times you have to sit back and go. And that's not to say AM was definitely getting him. Don't get me wrong. I don't want the Longhorn fans to lose their minds over here. But it was, there were very serious overtures from the Euros camp. And I think that's putting it lightly to where AM had to go back and, and, you guys understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying it was like, oh, viewers couldn't play at a and I, I think the dude has a chance to be phenomenal. But the Aggies had their guy. And and Jimbo, I think, was 1,000% bought in, Ari. And I think he saw exactly what you did and felt the same way. Since he got here to practice, I, I, a month ago, I would have said, man, that's going to be a hard ask between Haynes and Jake. I mean, Jake, Max, but he has shown something that during fall camp, like that stuff that you can't coach, right? The feel for the pressure, knowing which way to elude it, knowing when to step up, getting rid of the ball quickly, finding the right guy and getting rid of it in, in, you know, in the blink of an eye, just those things you can't coach. He's running around there wearing number 15 like Johnny did when he was on the scout team and like Mahomes wears. And you see just a lot of that same feel. So to answer your original question, I have no idea who's going to start. Because Haynes won the job last year. I think I, I think anybody would have told you it was his to lose. And he won it. And he they were going to build their whole offense around his, his skill set. And then Max Johnson comes in and, you know, He's had a great, he's had a really good spring, Max has. But put yourself, you know, you got to think along the lines of what Jimbo's thinking, right? He sees 27 touchdowns, six picks. He sees the son of an NFL Super Bowl winning quarterback. He sees a guy that looked pretty damn good in beating AM the last time he played. And he knows that there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of, uh, you know, moving parts there offensively in terms of the coordinators at LSU and the changing systems. And, and a bad O-line. So what do you think Jimbo Fisher thinks he can do with Max Johnson in a year's time? So this battle's wide open, and Wigman's in it, and Wigman's in it, and it, and it really is three. And, and so like Andy said, they got to have the dude to take that next step. I think a good quarterback can navigate this team to uh, back to a New Year's six. Good, not average, good. But if you want to go to that next level this year, it, it, they you you got to make the right pick because he's got to be he's got to be you know a future NFL guy, a future All SEC guy, whatever it is, he's got to be elite. My, my default's always play the kid. Like I'm like if Texas A and M doesn't start or Texas doesn't start Quinn Ewers this year, shoot me into the sun. And yeah. it's just like if if uh, <laughs> if Stetson I just think, Bennett winning the national title broke Ari's brain. Like yeah, I don't know. JT <laughs> Daniels and Brock Vandergriff sitting on the bench while Stetson Bennett is leading the national plays. title. Just, he's, he's yeah, no, plays. I know. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm a little half cocked after that. But I, uh, you know, I don't know. I I feel like there is a certain level, and like honestly, because. Uh, Stetson Bennett is the only real exception to that rule when you think about the last six or seven national uh, of champions. late, yes, because like go they're all like, got a dude at quarterback. Yeah, if you go back to like when Jake Coker led Bama to a national title, they had a Heisman Trophy winner at running back, and and they didn't have the level of QB. Like Jalen Hurts was really the first of that level QB they got, and then they Wally pipped him with with Tua, so, and they would have never won a national title. In my opinion, I, I think this is one of my tweets too, and I meant it then. And I love the kid. But I said Alabama will not win a national title with Jalen Hurts at quarterback, and they well, they wouldn't have won that game if they hadn't made the move. They Wally pipped it, and, and they Wally pipped him uh, because they had to. Yeah, or they were going to lose. And the that funniest game. thing about this whole thing is that that man is an NFL starter. Yeah, yeah, I, that's how good credit, he's good. <laughs> yeah, credit him, man. Like I. That was one that I think it was a time that Noel Mazzoni got here and he was committed. I think he was committed to Bama maybe already. And, and a &M was sneaking him in. And even then I was like, hell of an athlete, but I don't know. I don't know what kind of QB, you know, he's going to be. And I thought I, I would take him any day of the week because he's a great kid and he's an incredible athlete and coach's son. And, but I, 
I mean, he's done a hell of a lot more at quarterback than I than I thought he would coming out of high school, and even once he lost his job at Bama. And I'm sure some NFL people would have agreed with that sentiment too. They well, did. What's funny is is look at what Bama also had in the room, and the the best QB in the room probably was the one everybody thought was the worst QB in the room, and that's Mac Jones. So I mean, they, they had three NFL starters in their in their room at the same time, and I mean, no, you're not going to see that very often, but I guess Ohio State had that for a little while. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had uh, Braxton Miller, JT Barrett, Joe Burrow, and okay, uh, so you had two two starter, one one starter, and then and Dwayne Haskins, who was a first round. Dwayne draft Haskins, pick. who was a first yeah. round draft pick and Heisman finalist. Yeah. Well, Texas has Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre, and and Tom Brady. If you if you ask their fans right now, with that room, Malik Murphy. Uh, we, and, I I was I I we're not going to turn this into a Texas bashing session because I feel like I've been pretty harsh to Texas that the, the folks got mad about our, and they don't have me. They right. don't have me to, to back them up anymore. I'm out. Well, I, I actually like their offensive skill tag. You can't not like it. I no, mean, it's, I, they got a yeah. block for them. They signed a great O line class, but as you guys know, lines take a minute to come together, but uh, skill wise, my gosh, some of those. So, yeah. What is the, jump. what is the, uh, the Texas A&M fan temperament right now in terms of expectation. Like, do uh, they expect college football playoff contention now? Because I got an interesting mailbag question, and Andy was making fun of me about it. Because somebody yeah. asked me, if, uh, is, is Jimbo I, on the hot seat if they don't, yeah, <laughs> I don't make know. the playoff uh, this year? I didn't really pay attention to the second part because it was ridiculous. But the first part was, with the absurd class that Texas A&M put together, should it be considered anything less than an absolute disaster if they don't win a national title in the next three or four years? What's your answer to that? No, Here, here's my answer to that. It's twofold. Like everybody doing this, oh, the pressure's really dialed up now. I hope they understand. that You, you signed a coach that for a, a record-setting contract to get him from Florida State. Then you gave him a record-setting extension. The expectation at A&M, what, it, yes, it, the ultimate goal is the national title, but the expectation is for Texas A&M to be one of the elite college football programs during Jimbo Fisher's tenure, not wire to wire, but at some point in his so, tenure. So, so beat Georgia the last few years because it, like, yeah, what I kept saying with Georgia is if they stay at this level and keep coming back to this level every year, they will eventually break through. Mm-hmm. They did. Andy, th- this is where you and I were arguing though, because yeah, Georgia, for whatever reason, like if, if you take before, like your, your thought process going into last year, Georgia, really hadn't done anything on the field. I, and I know that they got other than, this, the, other than, other than making one it, miracle yeah, pass yeah. from winning the national no, title. No, no, other I know, than but that. I'm saying like over the course of the past <laughs> seven years, they had, and maybe that's the thing that's propping what Ari, I'm going to say up. They were no, winning in overtime in the national title game. They had no, done no, no, some listen, stuff. Listen, listen, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to just act like that doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is, is that Georgia had been viewed for the most part of the past five years as one of the five elite programs in America. Yeah, and do you think it's because of the way that they recruited, or do you think it's because of that overtime loss to Bama in the championship? Well, game? they also won the SEC that year, so that also counts. Like, you, you can't so say that A&M A&M I'm saying, like, anything. I'm saying, can you view A and M in that same light? I need like, when them, do you start I need viewing them to them? go to Atlanta like that? Like, okay, and and that's that's a yeah. great like right now. You got you got to think about A and M. They've never won the West. They've yep. ne- and they've been ten years. It's not like, but they've never won the West. They've never, like you said, gone to Atlanta. They certainly haven't won an SEC title. They haven't reached a playoff. If, like, Jimbo's not on the hot seat if they don't. But this class, oh, he's got to win big with this class. Yes, he does. That's your five, six, seven. Today's day and age, probably not many of them will be yeah, so around for Suddenly that eight. buyout is manageable by the end of that. Yeah, and, so. and the reality is, oh, not, of yeah, course, I mean, Jimbo, so off. you could not- have asked him and been like, Hey, do you think you need to win something big and substantial by year seven? And he would have said, shit, yeah. So it's, of course, these next few years, the expectation. And what I keep telling people is I'd rather go into those battles because if AM signed the 20th best class, then the pressure would really be on because you better win something in these next three years, but you're having to go do it with the 20th ranked class and well, without a But it seems to me that, 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 that A&M become, is, if you had that it becomes hopeless because yeah. then well, you and I are going to be on the wrong end of Twitter beats yeah. if that happens. Yeah, yeah. you're no, I have to agree with you at that point. 
<laughs> yeah, because you're locked into the long term contract with the coach. That they've made it. You know, A and M did this. We've seen Michigan State do this. We've seen Penn State do this now, where there's so much guaranteed in the coach's deal. Like it's got to work with this guy. Mm-hmm. Like you can't pull the ripcord on on this. So but here's the thing that nobody says, Andy, and I, I believe this, and I could be proven wrong. If you look at the talent on campus and you talk to the people that come through every day, like I know we all do, the scouts, the NFL GMs, the personnel, the even the former play, like the people that come through and see it every day, and especially the ones like you, Andy, that tour the country and you can watch practice and you see this team looks nothing like it ever had. It just keeps under Jimbo every year. The guys that they trot out there, you go, holy cow. And they, they look more and more and they're right there on the footstep. And when this whole class gets there, they're, they're right there on the footstep of, of Georgia and Bama. You look at the guys going out, and AM had a bunch of NFL guys, and Kenyon Green will be a first rounder, and they might have a couple of seconds. But you still see what Georgia sent out the door this year, and it's still a, it's still a big difference. Well, that and, difference. and already covered all those Ohio State teams. Like, yeah, you just you just see when they walk in the building how different it is, how different yeah. it looks. Well, we're talking about all this like year seven th- stuff right now. But I feel like they are just now at the beginning stages of that transformation, which is why I, I want to buy stock in them. Yeah, they're, they're, they they're basically where Georgia was in 2017. Is and I'll the tell thought. you this right now. If Texas A&M signs a class, and again, I don't think that they're going to be able to match what they did last year. If they do, holy yeah, crap. And they'll probably but, only sign 18 or 19 this year. But too. if they sign a, a class that has 8 to 10 top 100 players, which I think is certainly manageable considering yeah. what they just did. I will begin to view a and if not already kind of already, the same way I viewed Georgia going into last year, which is a super talented team that has the ability to win a national championship if things come together. And there are only five to seven teams, speaking generously, that have that opportunity in a given year. And when you and I got into our Twitter beef mm-hmm. uh, about a and two years ago, they were not built that way, which was a huge reason why I, I didn't think that. But if the same exact scenario from two years ago happened again and AM was built the way that they seem to be being built right now, my opinion about where they should be in the playoff discourse would be completely different. And, and, and that could be what's... right or wrong, but they're almost yeah. there. And I'm like 100% sure that it is only a matter of, of when, not if, if they continue to build their roster this way. And, and that's so... what's interesting because AM, you know, the argument was AM and Notre Dame. I yeah. would argue that they were at that point built similarly. Where yeah. there's some elite NFL talent, but it just doesn't go as deep as Alabama or Georgia or what Ohio State is usually. Yeah. Yeah, right, and now it it and feels now A&M's like it's more might. more talented than Clemson. I think today, right now, yeah, and I think with that class coming in here, here's the thing that that I keep saying, and Ari, you you really are saying exactly what I've been telling people. I think that window, A and M and Jimbo stepped into that window in 2020 and whether they should have been in the playoffs or not. Like, again, I I can hear all sides of it, but they were right there and they were right outside the the door, but they went nine and one. They won an orange bowl. I think had Haynes King not gotten hurt last year. I think that team goes 10 and two. They were eight and four. Maybe they don't beat Bama because Calzada was so good that day. Maybe AM tries to do more QB run game and they don't quite get the off and they can't whatever. But I think that team goes 10 and 2. And I think you're back to back years. You look at how close their losses were to Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and LSU, even you know, without the guy that they thought was right. And, and Arkansas happens right after the the King injury and the line, the yeah. old line's not really set up yet. So, so yeah, I mean, I, it, think it could have been a, I think that's a yeah. New Year Six team, Andy. And I think what we're doing now is the conver- imagine the conversation then if AM went orange and Sugar Bowl in back to back years. And then, so I think we're in that window already, just like you're saying. And I do think it needs to happen. I don't know exactly what it is. Is it multiple playoff bursts? Is it like kind of like kind of like that Georgia thing before they won it? But I think we're we're right there, and I agree with you, Ari. And I, whether it happens this year, where the first year starting QB, or if it's the next year when that whole class is in year two, and you return a starting quarterback and you return five O linemen, I think that year is is the real year you circle. But I think you want to see A and M this season. I think it's fair to expect, and I think what you want to see is them 
jump back on that track where they were before Haynes King broke his ankle last I year. I think in two years from now, and I'm assuming that they're going to sign a very good class this in, in 2023, but in 2023 season, um, that is the year that I want to see them be a legitimate uh, national title contender. Agree. I, I don't know that it's this year, uh, especially considering the fact that the person that I believe will be the quarterback of the future might not even start. Uh, yeah. But by that year, when you have some of that skill, talent, um, because they're still freshmen, like they, they're in yeah. the program, but they have to be on the field for it to take effect. And yeah. I think by year two, with the, I mean, how many top 100 players do they sign? Like 16? Yeah. If it was 16 yeah. top 100 players, just say half of them hit big, which would yep. be a low percentage, but just say half. That means you have eight uh, top 100 players contributing as starters on the field, given, um, you know, given good breaks. And I think that there are probably what four other teams in the entire country that have that, that can say that. Yeah. And this is not a very senior heavy team either. This, this fall, they'll lose some key guys. I'm assuming a chain and Antonio Johnson probably be on their way to the NFL and Anaya Smith, but overall the overall numbers, they're, they're not going to lose a lot either. Well, it, it's going to be fun to watch. And, and the thing is, if they can do what we, what we're talking about, Let's let's say they are where Georgia was in 2017, which remember Georgia doesn't win a national title for four more years mm-hmm. at that point. Yeah, but if that happened, it would put A and M right in that window, right when Texas and Oklahoma joined the SEC. Wow. And how crazy would that be? Especially if Texas can can get things going right. How much fun! Is that first Texas A and M Texas game? Because Georgia just back. kept doing it and doing it and doing it every right. they year. Just, they kept didn't getting win. bites at the apple. Yes, didn't win, but added nine other top one hundred players. Didn't win, added thirteen, right. and then yeah. eventually it had to come together. Now, here's the one thing I will say: the unfortunate reality is that Texas A and M and Alabama play in the same division. So as long the as divisions Nick are going away, yeah, no, I know, that, but that's not until down the line. Yeah. And it's like Georgia wouldn't have won the national championship this year if they played in the same division. Yeah. So it's right. going to be a harder, a harder path for AM to get there because they play in the toughest division uh in football, especially considering the fact that you know Auburn can you know jump up and get you at any point and LSU if they get back to even 80% of what they were a few years ago. I mean, that's a really, really hard division. How, how crazy what? would it be if Tw- Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC is the thing that pushes Texas AM? into that spot because, because you don't have to beat Alabama away. to get to the national G- or to get to yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. What if it's 2023 and I know right now they're saying it would probably be more like 24 or whatever, but what if it's yeah. 2023 and A&M and, and Connor Wigman are at the, they, they, they've, they've made it through. They didn't have to play Bama and they're about to win and, and go play for an SEC title with a chance against to go to Bama. National. And yeah, and their last regular season game is at Kyle Field against Quinn Ewers in Texas. <laughs> the first amazing. time they played in 12 or 13 years. And, and that's the final step before they get to go play for an SEC. I mean, it's, it's just it's as, a, as a casual football fan who has so no exciting. stake whatsoever in, in yeah. the Texas AM, Texas disdain for one another. Mm-hmm. That is freaking awesome. Yeah. I'm Who would want that? I did not want the game to be played when AM was in the SEC and Texas was in the Big 12. I, I we can go on all day. I think Texas and the way they acted about it and going to try to rally up a, a this just block of teams that wouldn't play AM in any sport, Tuesday night baseball, midweek softball, volleyball, whatever you name it, TCU, OU, Oak State, Baylor, Tech, that whole the the whole reaction to AM leaving. And how badly Texas could have used uh, every other year at home game against A and M for that schedule and for that exposure that A and M no longer needed, I was one thousand percent opposed to it. You don't help them. You don't give them. If, if you play four times and you go two and two, they win. Why would you ever enter into something like that? It's literally like what Las Vegas has going. It's a racket. I. But now that they're in the same conference, I am so fired up, and I can't wait. Tuesday night, they played in baseball. Win or lose, that was an awesome environment and atmosphere. It was Texas' second largest crowd at the dish, and you think about how many big games have been played over there. 
So I'm totally fired up for this football rivalry to be renewed now that they're in the same conference because it's equal now. It's equal. You know, uh, there's not an advantage that AM has that they're going to share with Texas. Texas is coming in. It's level playing field. Let's go. I, this is this is amazing. I can't wait. Um, now I am ready. I just want it all to start now. I want games tomorrow, but AM has to play their spring game. They got to pick a quarterback. Billy, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait until you and Ari are vacationing together in Cabo. We'll face you. He said, he Twitter, said that yes, we have a lot Twitter of beefs common, across Billy. the pool. I feel like we, we became friends today, but I still don't know much about you as a person. And Andy says that you and I have a lot in common. So he has. He's told me the same. So uh, we'll, do, we'll do it soon in Dallas. Ari, right? Ari, Billy lives the life that you imagine you want to live. Oh, yeah. I'm tired. I'm tired, oh, yeah. Ari. Take, but you're married. So I don't know. You can't, I guess. You can do part of it, but he's got like uh, two more weeks. Oh, oh yeah, part of it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old. I'm I old get what you're tired. saying. I was in Dallas Saturday night with a bunch of uh, the WWE people, just uh, hanging at WrestleMania former, casually. Yeah, former uh, wrestlers there, and I went out, and I felt about like I did the last time I went out with your other Twitter rival Johnny about a month ago. It's like if I do that one time. It, it really has become like a three day recovery. You want to hear a funny thing? Um, so Johnny, when he first got drafted uh, by the Cleveland Browns, mm -hmm. do you, you'll probably remember this because it was a big deal, but he went to a pool party at Mandalay Bay in Vegas. <gasps> yeah. And everybody flipped out. Remember? Like they were like, why isn't this guy in training camp or whatever time of year it was? And it was his own time. And there were a bunch of pictures of him. Um, drinking and having a good time and i just want you all to know that i was at that pool party the same <laughs> pool party i was there and i was dancing you it was daylight. memorial day memorial day weekend daylight Mandalay bay LED. yeah they were all there and so was there was another basketball player from the bulls i can't remember who it was but i was actually seeing this girl at the time and it's hilarious to admit now but when i was with this girl at daylight johnny called her up on stage yeah. And she went. <laughs> this is like a we sliding there, doors moment. Cool you guys could have met right then. <laughs> I will show you the group picture from that. She might have been in the group picture, but I was. There's I'll a picture of that her that was... floats. The girl that I was with that floating around the internet of him when he was taking pictures with a bunch of girls. Like one of the pictures was of her uh, with him, oh. and it's just like that is far worse than anything he. Could. And she came back. Thank God, you know, but like, what, what am I, Miss Johnny Manziel is going to steal my girl? You think that a tweet's going to hurt my feelings, Johnny? Yeah, you're like, you've done far worse. And then I went friend. back and I wrote a column in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, because that's where I worked at the time, yeah. about how people were overreacting and dumb for giving him shit for enjoying himself after getting drafted in Vegas <laughs> and defended him. He should be if thanking only they you. Knew, you tell, you you tell Johnny that. trying to steal your girl. Yeah, you, and awesome. you, you tell Johnny that. I will. I absolutely. I'll send you the link. He should be. I, I want an apology. I will. We're gonna see it. <laughs> and you read like it needs to be as many words as that damn tweet you sent out too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As much <laughs> thought. Yeah, but you you come up to Dallas, or I'm I'll probably I, I told Britt because I've only been to College Station once that we want to come down. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll get your information from Andy, and we'll we'll have to get together. Absolutely. This is, this is gonna be to. this is gonna be so beautiful until until Ari ditches a and the way he ditches the way he ditched texas like it was just like that he just turned off the faucet and m's and m's got the nuts a and m did the hardest thing they've done the hardest thing they've converted into that into that rare air of of recruiting that makes your program great and yeah. i think it's hard to lose that so oh, I'm very I, I heard what you what said do. about texas before you turned your back on them too so I, I, texas listen, doesn't have a single recruiting class that can compare to what a m just did i can't imagine <laughs> if i did what y'all do how many times i would flip flop like i'm locked in i'm well, I think, but, but it's not okay, flip flopping like, yeah if, if information changes if yeah that's yeah, what yeah. i was trying it, to explain to texas changes. fans like yeah. in 2010 i ranked texas the number one job in the country mm -hmm. but things changed it became a very hard place to win. And so it's not the best job in the country anymore. It's just, I have a hard time not. with Aggies trashing uh, Herbie because they love to do it lately, Ever since, really ever since that playoff thing. Um, and then them laughing in the car about the Kyle Field atmosphere, him and Bear and Fowler, which I disagreed with that because I was just like, 
Of course, it's not as tough a place to play anymore because AM hasn't been good for the better part of 20 years. What they're actually saying is true. I just thought they were laughing about it a little too much. It's like every other school that's that's been, you know, a slightly above average for the better part of two decades. I mean, everyone's been through it, really. Uh, Herb Street can't win, though, no matter what he no. says, because it reaches so many people that it's going to piss somebody off, but no matter I always, what. I always tell people, though, Herbie's been burned by AM so many times that we forget how many times he's gone out on the limb for the Aggies over the last 20 years. He, he really has. So it's kind of like, okay, let's not forget that this guy stuck his, stuck his neck out there and had it chopped off, uh, you know, pushing for AM. Well, so you've, you've got, you've got our, the, the, the embrace of Ari Wasserman right now. I'm here to tell you, I watched him dump Texas. I mean, within like five yeah. seconds. So just it wasn't he five might seconds, do it, it was to 10 you. years of looking like a moron. Like, like, <laughs> like when Johnny Manziel tried to steal his girl, he might do it to you. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see. But Billy, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, Enjoy bad. the spring game. We will uh we will have to do some more day drinking at Shimmy's one of these days and uh and hire we hired Jimbo Fisher while day drinking at Shimmy's. I don't know if everybody knows that. Like seven months, eight months. That was a hell of a secret. We were both like, don't say anything. <laughs> What'd you say? I said, Andy, I wouldn't even tell you begin to tell you who I think would be our coach because you'd laugh. And you said, Can I guess? I said, Yeah, you go, Jimbo. I said, Why do you say that? <laughs> You're like, well, I was just there, or, or was it earlier? I had, yeah, I've been in Tallahassee recently. But you're like, yeah, so I, meant, he had, I mentioned AM, and he just kind of, you said he kind of perked up and the whole tone. Well, it, of it. So let, let's set the scene, though. It's the day of Chili Fest. Yeah, which and was so, this past weekend. So there are every fraternity and sorority essentially has gathered at Shimmy's. and everybody's in their boots and they're all going out to go get drunk and eat chili in a field somewhere. And so Billy and I are just watching the scene. Like the people watching is incredible. And we're sitting there and it's three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And we're like, okay, we are pretty sure a and is going to make a change after this season. So who's it going to be? And my, my thing was process of elimination more than anything else. And just kind of understanding where Scott Woodward's head was at. And, and Billy, and so we, we, we hatched it and, we, at the end of the end of that afternoon, we were like, there's no way this is going to happen. They're never hiring Jimbo Fisher and left it at that. Yep. That was it. But, and then UCLA happened. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So you never know, but what, it, what's the lesson here as always day drinking on a Friday afternoon is the greatest thing you can possibly do. Solves all and you, problems. And you might have good ideas. All right, Enjoy guys. your Fridays. Thank you. All. <laughs>